so when it comes to india we should be thorough about the three models that is epc model boat build operate and transfer this we already know next is ham model hybrid annuity model epc model is engineering procurement and construction model right so we should be thorough about these three models because these models are actually the ham hybrid annuity annuity model is a combination of ebc and bot build operate and transfer model good morning students welcome back to blue test is right today we are in 52nd day we have successfully completed 51 topics right so we are studying the economics topic right so today in that we will uh, today's class we are going to study about two important topics that is one is ppp public private partnership at the second aspect also we are going to cover in this lecture only that is fdi foreign direct investment right so these topics are very very important uh, actually they have been specifically mentioned in the main syllabus right in paper 3 economics part so they have been specifically uh, specifically mentioned uh, both the ppp public private partnership and fdi flows into india however they are important from the point of view of mains also sorry prelims also so we have to study them right so uh, we should we need not go into the in depth from the prelims point of view uh, in the mains we have to study about them in detail uh, for the prelims point of view you have to generally know some things about both ppp and uh, fdi so we will try to cover Uh, some aspects related to both these topics right so first we will see the definition of ppp public or private partnership so it is a collaborative effort between between whom between the government and the private player private player or we can say private sector right so basically private sector comprises of private companies right So the purpose is major purpose of ppp is to develop infrastructure develop infrastructure so you know very well uh, the infrastructure is very essential for an economy we have to provide infrastructure basic infrastructure facilities uh, to the people however first thing infrastructure it has we can say highly capital intensive i mean we need first capital to invest the returns will come after a long period so it has long saturation periods saturation period this is the second thing so also it needs effective management effective management or we can also say execution right to be successfully implemented the infrastructure projects they require effective execution or ex effective management so as you as you all know very well when it comes to the management part management part we have studied during the when we were studying the public sector enterprises also so the government is or we can say bureaucracy will be involved in the execution of the projects if the government implements that project or if the government takes up the project so a government bureaucracy it is poor in management of the projects especially we can understand from the examples of uh, hydroelectric power projects or for example many other projects that have been taken up the taken up by the government we can see plenty of examples they run into delays and once the delay happens where uh, once a delay uh, the projects are delayed what happens it they it will lead to subsequently cost overruns right so there are instances that 
some hydroelectric power projects or for for that matter dams they have uh, they have run into like 30 years 40 years delay there is uh, there are uh, i mean some infamous examples where the construction of dams has led, uh, has led to 30 to 40 years of delay so there are many instances that the cost overruns also multiplied by 10 times more than 10 times there are many such examples so because of the delays the cost uh, initially before starting the i mean project only whatever may uh, may be the project infrastructure project or for example the dams that will be built on the rivers or for example roads also if the government is laying roads so we have i mean there will be an estimated cost for that project so we have seen many examples there are many examples that the cost cost have multiplied by more than 10 times also so there are several examples like that so to address all these challenges the, these have been the challenges so to address all these challenges the ppp public private partnership has sought as a solution because the government cannot pool all the required money so some part of the money that will be pooled by the private sector or later we will study about the different types of ppp models so in that in some models the government provides some money in some other models the private sector it itself pools the entire money apart from that one thing is that money is coming from the private sector second thing is that the management so the private sector is known for effective management so one uh, disadvantage is there that is they always work for the profit motive uh, whereas that should that shall not be a primary motive when it comes to the government projects uh, whatever the projects may be the infrastructure projects or for that matter any project however the private players are motivated by uh, profit maximization so if we leave that aspect apart so they are known for effective project management and implementation so to realize these goals and also to uh, timely complete the projects on time timely completion of the infrastructure projects and the several other benefits are also there to all uh, to realize all these things the ppp model has been sought after so if we say simply it is nothing but the government and the private sector coming together and implementing a particular infrastructure project so that is the ppp public private partners so we can say since the last two decades since we can say 2000s or we can say late 1990s the ppp it has become lot lot popular right so earlier also there were there some partnerships were there between the government and the private sector but this model was not that popular we can say from the early 2000s or late 1990s this has become we can say a buzzword right so uh, for now we can say almost every pro- project we can say 90% of the projects in especially the infrastructure projects that have been taken by the government they are being built in public private partnership only right right so this is about the uh, this is a brief introduction about the public private partnerships now we will see different types of public private partnership right so this is also an important aspects we can expect a question from this area right so there are different types of uh, models of public private partnership first one is bot uh, build operate transfer so here what happens the private company builds a project it finances the project and it operates the project for a certain period of time then it will transfer that project to the government then once uh, once that uh, project that is transferred to the government it will become the national asset or public asset best examples are roads roads and uh, roads for that matter we can say highways both uh, state highways and central uh, national highways so generally the private sector uh, builds the road so generally here land will be provided by the government or sometimes the private company itself 
purchases or acquires uh, acquires the land so after that it builds the road it operates the road so by financing itself it builds the road for some time after building it operates the road for example let's say for 20 years or let's say sometimes it is 15 years it will operate the road so during that time if there are any repairs to that road also it is the responsibility of the private company to repair the roads so during that period the maintenance and repair repair and uh, repair and maintenance is also the responsibility of the private company right so during that time they will do once the road is completion and once it comes to use so they will collect toll from the uh, we can say the riders who are using that road for transportation so they will collect the road so by uh, they will collect the toll so by collecting the toll they will get their investment back so first they are uh, putting finance and they are building the road so once that road is ready when uh, uh, people started using that road so there will be toll plazas you have seen so they will collect the toll uh, at the toll plazas in this way they will get their investment back right so in this way the government is uh, free from uh, pooling finance because uh, the government is starved of funds because they have to spend on the welfare schemes also and also they have to look after the day to day administration expenditure for day to day administration so because of all these reasons the government is starved of funds so it cannot invest in the pro- huge infrastructure fra- projects so uh, through the ppp model especially uh, one model we have discussed bot build operate and transfer so the finance Uh, the private company it is pooling the resources and it is uh, building the infrastructure and it is operating the infrastructure that particular project for some time then it is transferring the particular project to the government so in this way the without much effort the government is readying a particular we can say project or it is uh, getting a facility that after that after the toll collection for let's say 15 years or 20 years it will be freely used by the people all right so in this way a infra an infrastructure project project is being ready so in this way the government also engage private players like doing many other we can say infrastructure creation for like let's say building a new railway station let's say building a new airport right so best examples are the hyderabad international airport and the t3 when it comes to delhi terminal 3 indira gandhi international airport t3 so both these airports have been built by gmr crew right so in this way the government can engage the private players to build various types of infrastructure projects right next type of project is uh dbot that is design build operate and transfer so here one additional part is being added here design so the design of the project will also be uh, made by the private player only after that the uh, same thing it builds it operates and it transfers the project to the government next is build own operate this is one model so here the project uh, private player it will build the project it owns the project for certain period of time so here though the uh, private player is building and operating it when it comes to ownership the ownership remains with the government only not with the private player however in the third model for some time the entire project will be owned by the private player only so after that it will be transferred to the government so let's say here examples are building of ports so ports are there so this model is uh, being followed in building certain kinds of ports right so here the private company finances builds and owns the project for a long term often collecting user fees to recoup cost and earn so this is the thing. so after a long period of time owning the project for a long period of time let's say for example 50 years 60 years 70 years after it is getting all the 
uh, we can say investment and also earning profits multiple times then it will be transferred to the government so this is the build operate build own and operate model next is operate maintain and transfer so here the private company takes over the operation and the maintenance of an existing public asset for a specific period before returning it to the government so here let's say a particular public project is there government project is i mean project is there it is already there so it will be given on a lease kind of thing to the private paper uh, private player then he will operate that infrastructure project and he will maintain or the private company will maintain for a particular period of time then it will again transfer it to the government right next one is lease develop and operate so here the government leases uh, the land to a private company which then develops and operates on it and eventually transfers the ownership back to the government so here also uh, there is a i mean recently there is a development called in uh, ports development landlord model has been brought up landlord uh, port model is uh, being brought up so this is very similar to this kind of thing lease develop and operate so here the government will be the owner of the port however it will be the particular port will be leased to the private player a private player and they will maintain and they will operate that particular port for a certain period of time right so these are some of the popular models when it comes to ppp right however so when it comes to india we should be thorough about the three models that is epc model boat build operate and transfer this we already know next is ham model hybrid annuity model epc model is engineering procurement and construction model right so we should be thorough about these three models because these models are actually the ham hybrid annuity annuity model is a combination of ebc and bot build operate and transfer model so this ham model has been we can say specially designed by india or uh, specially designed for the conditions that are there in india so this has been way much successful way much successful in building the national highways right so ham ham model is hybrid annuity model it is the combination of both epc model and bot model it is very very successful in india uh, in building uh, in building the road uh, road projects or infrastructure road infrastructure projects especially it is highly used for the building the national highways and it is it has already given very good results right so because of this reason we have to know the details about this model the first one is epc model engineering procure, procurement and construction model so in this model the government takes the lead role right so the government identifies the project arranges financing and awards a contract to a private company the private company acts as a contractor responsible for the entire design procurement of materials and the construction of the project once completed the project is entirely owned and operated by the government so here entire finance and design is being provided by the government the private company will uh, build it uh, procure all the required material and once it builds the project it will transfer it to the government so here the entire money uh is coming from the government only so try to remember the advantages and disadvantage disadvantage of this model also so here if we see the advantages it is simpler and a pro- faster project execute execution happens here government retains complete control over the project so whatever the toll that is collected by uh, collected there it will entirely come to the government disadvantages if we see the government bears the entire financial burden right there are, uh, there is less incentive for the private company to participate in this model so these are the uh, we can say the disadvantages of epc right. next is build operate transfer model we have already seen it so here the private company takes the much larger role 
the private company finances designs builds and operates the project for a specified uh, pre specified time so during this period the private company receives its investment and earns a profit by collecting user fees like if we see if we take a road it will collect the toll right after the concession period ownership of the pro- project will be transferred to the government if we see the advantages it reduces the government's financial burden by leveraging private capital this we have seen because the entire cost has to be borne by the private player only private companies have vested interest here so efficiency and quality will be much more better right next is if we see the disadvantages project completion can be delayed if the private company struggles to secure financing actually this has happened because uh, the infrastructure projects they have a long maturity period so before getting the re- returns we have to completely invest the capital into that so the banks have been lending to infrastructure projects so because of because the companies who have taken loans for building the infrastructure projects they could not repay the loans in time so those uh, we can say uh, whatever the advances or loans that have been given to the infrastructure companies they have turned to be npas non performing assets because of this reason the banks had to face lot of problems so during 4 to 5 years back it was a hot topic npas non performing assets for the hot topic this is the actual reason so one side the government was promoting infrastructure development through ppp so the banks have been asked to give loans to the private companies which are executing the infrastructure projects so accordingly they have advanced loans to these infrastructure projects and the private companies because the maturity of these infrastructure projects is very long let's say 10 years 20 years 15 years so wherever the banks are dependent on short term we can say deposits uh, one side the short term deposits are short term because people will be uh, i mean parking their money for a shorter periods a shorter period and they will be withdrawing however the infrastructure projects require long term investment so the loans have to be given given for a long time so because the maturity is a long for longer time they could not repay the loans in time leading to npa problem in india so the story you know about the mpa and uh, what happened during the raguram rajan's tenure so there was kind of ever greening of loans to the infrastructure companies however he said that nothing doing you have to show the nps as per the rules so the npa prog- problem has come out so it led to it led to several other consequences now we can say the problem is being addressed through various uh, measures like uh, the bad bank it has been created and also the uh, we have also brought up the insolvency and bankrupt bankrupt bankruptcy code ibc so through all these measures we can say the npa problem is now somewhat controlled be controlled so this is the story behind this thing. so these are the disadvantages so to address or to take the and pull the advantage advantages and to omit the disadvantages disadvantages of these two models epc model and uh, boat model the ham model hybrid annuity model has been brought in right so this model it is a blend of epc and bot models uh, where the government makes fixed payments to the private company during the concession period so ratio will be shared by 40 is to 60 so the government will pay 40% of the i mean it will share the 40% of the uh, investment for that particular project project whereas 60% will be contributed by the private company right here the finances are being shared right so the government uh, contributes a fixed percentage so 40% of the project cost in installments linked to the achieving specific milestones so there will be milestones uh, milestones decided so by this time this much of the project has to be completed then a lot of certain percentage of this 40% will be advanced to the private company this arrangement is there so the private company finances the remaining amount 
and it is responsible for design construction and operation right so under bot there are no user fees but in the instead the government makes fixed annuity payments to the private company throughout the concession period sorry unlike the bot so there are no user fees so here there are there is no user fee the government makes fixed annuity payments to the private player right advantages of home if you see it reduces the financial risk of the private company compared to board here some part of the investment is shared by the government so in this way the risk for the fina- uh, the private company has been reduced right it offers some cost benefits for the government as compared to pure bot models disadvantages some disadvantages are also there so it's a more complex model to structure and manage compared to epc so may be still less attractive to private companies compared to bot with user fees potentially impacting participation right so here in the bot model because the private player is operating uh, they they can collect the user fees however the user fee component is not there here still the private companies uh, may not come forward to uh, participate in this model however we can say after the experience of let's say 6 uh, to 7 years it has been a great success uh, model has been a great success in india and uh, we have achieved a good success in uh, improving the uh, national highways in the country right so apart from the prelims you can expect a question on these models in the mains also so try to remember all the features of the three models and their advantages and disadvantages so that you can do a critical analysis of the models next if we see the advantages of public private partnership it is advantages briefly we will see but one thing is funding and expertise we have seen the private company will bring in the inv- in investment required investment and also it will bring the expertise private management so that will come next is efficiency and speed so private sector is known for efficiency and completing the projects speedily within the given time so this will also will occur next is innovation and technology so many innovative innovative ways will be adopted and the technology the state of the art technology will be infused into the projects risk sharing so in this model both the private company and the government they both can share the risk the risk is not only on the single entity improved service delivery so uh, by blending all these features there will be better service delivery at the end of the day to the people of india next is potential for cost savings so there is a potential in these through this method uh, for both uh, for the government of india because we have understood earlier that when the government itself executes the project there are lot of time overruns and also cost overruns so that uh, it was uh, uh, making a huge impact uh, impact on the public purse and the valuable tax payers money has been uh, we can say uh, not that uh, not being used that much efficiently so that can be avoided right so these are the benefits of the ppp so if we see the developments in the ppc ppp sector recently in india right investment size so according to the latest data uh, the national uh, infrastructure pipeline has been announced by the government so we can say it is part and parcel of the ppp only ppp is a broader one and this national infrastructure pipeline so it is a specific component of the ppp model so through this national national infrastructure pipeline the government has targeted that 111 lakh crore rupees have been targeted and that this much of investment can be has to be brought up into the infrastructure projects right project numbers if we see so according to the available data there uh, are like 6828 ppp projects have been taken up in india investment when we see the investment 54.12 lakh crore rupees as of december 2020 right this is the number and the size of the ppp projects in india try to remember these facts 
so you can quote these numbers in the mains examination right. sectors if we see most of the investment has gone into uh, sectors like uh, roads so they have con constituting 41 percent next is power it is contributing approximately 20 percent so if we see the uh, trend shifting towards urban infrastructure so in urban infrastructure the investment investments or ppp partnership is taking in areas like rail railways airports and water treatment plants social sector also the uh, ppp is taking place healthcare and education they are explored for ppp models so this shift is happening if we see one or two success stories through the ppp model first success story is the delhi mumbai railway station develop uh, sorry the railway development so these projects are being undertaken through ppps aiming of improved passenger experience and infrastructure uh, modernization next is power grid corporation of india so this public sector giant successfully raised funds through in, uh, infrastructure investment trust a first for the government leveraging private capital capital for existing assets so these are the two success stories that we can also quote in the examination right so however there are certain challenges when it comes to ppp so the ppp model in india it has shown promise but also faces challenges so if we see the challenges challenges with the project preparation and execution so lengthy approval process so when it comes to approvals again the bureaucracy will be involved so bureaucracy whenever it involves it leads to red tape and delays next is poor project preparation so the government is not an expert in preparing the projects so it is uh, project preparation challenges will be faced if we see the financial hurdles difficulty in securing private finance so we have seen the aspect of npa how the banks after advancing loans to the infrastructure projects they have experienced npa non performing asset problem the private companies they were in a no position to repay the loans within the within the given time so in this way it is leading to securing investment after that after the npa problem next is unequal risk sh risk sharing though there is a uh, certain i mean certain part of risk risk sharing between the government and the private company still it is not equal so let's say the risk of securing finance or the failure risk they are more on the private player and less on the government right next is project implementation issues so in this the major important aspect is land acquisition delays so still in india the land acquisition is a major problem so we could not uh, we can say realize the goal of uh, land pooling land pooling and uh, using correct type of land for building the infrastructure projects so especially the agricultural land which is fertile and let's say it is giving uh, two crops uh, yearly and uh, which has the irrigation facility also so this kind of land has to be omitted uh, generally for the infrastructure projects however uh, there have been lot of issues when it comes to the acquisition of land in india so you know very well uh, about all these issues so there has been a certain act has been brought for acquiring the land however it has faced a lot of criticism at the end of the day it has to be withdrawn or lot of amendments have to be made to that particular act so still it is a concern land acquisition is still a concern next is uh, re renegotiation issues so whenever there are we can say cha changes or challenges in the issue in the project execution so there are challenges in renegotiating the terms and conditions also right next is transparency and accountability concerns so lack of transparency in uh, tendering process this is one issue and uh, weak monitoring monitoring and accountancy because so whatever whenever the government is a major uh, i mean the investment coming from the government the cag has to audit those projects so critics argue that the ppp projects they have to also to be open to the audit audit by the cag however 
now they are out of the purview of the cog all the ppp public private partnership projects so this issue has also to be addressed right so after that there are sector specific issue also right so all these challenges they contribute to underperformance of the uh, ppp projects right so to address the issues of uh, or problems that are there in the ppp public private partnership sector so vijay kelkar committee has been appointed during the year 2015 so the committee has made valuable recommendations to trigger again once again trigger the interest in public private partnership by solving the whatever the problems faced uh, that are there in the uh, public private partnership sector so one thing uh, the committee has recommended is uh, institutional framework so it recommended that for establishing a dedicated dedicated institution like 3p india uh, to act as a knowledge center and a support capacity building for effective implementation of the ppp projects so 3p india it is one suggestions all right so and also it suggested enacting a ppp law public private partnership partnership law uh, for facilitate a ppp expansion into new sectors like healthcare and urban transport so it has asked the government or recommended that a ppp law has to be made next in terms of project selection and design if we see the recommendations uh, limit to ppps to large projects ensuring better risk allocation and attracting large private players develop model concession agreements with the standardized terms for different sectors so these are the some of the recommendations when it comes to project selection and the design so basically the uh, committee recommended for confining ppp only to larger projects all right it also asked for discouraging the public sector undertakings from participating in ppps to enhance private sector involvement next is risk sharing and dispute resolution so implement a case based risk uh, risk allocation mechanism tailoring risk sharing between the government and the private player right uh, apart from that establish independent regulatory uh, regulatory agencies for effective dispute resolution so for now uh, there are tribunals they are the first level of uh, we can say the <coughs> dispute resolution bodies next the cases will go to either high court or supreme court so however it is asking for more uh, a separate independent agency for uh, we can say uh, to uh, solve the disputes whenever they arise in the ppp right next is project implementation and monitoring so create uh, create an inbuilt mechanism for regulation within ppp contracts to address the unforeseen circumstances right next is improve the fiscal reporting practices and the performance monitoring of ppp projects to ensure transparency and accountability focus on service del- uh, delivery shift to focus of ppcs ppps ppps from uh, purely fiscal benefits to delivering better services for the public so these are the some of the major recommendation of the vijay kelkar committee when it comes to ppp projects right so this is the these are the some of the important aspects about the uh, public private partnership in india now we will understand about the foreign direct investment so this is completely a new topic however mostly they are uh, limited and they are similar topics so the pattern of questions is also similar from these two topics however uh, so because of these reasons i have tried to club these topics in one single lecture so foreign direct investment is simply the investment investment it is coming from a foreign entity or foreign country into the uh, countries like india especially the fdi will be from developed developed countries like usa etc singapore etc to develop into developing countries and it will be invested in the greenfield projects greenfield projects so uh, it it will be used that particular investment be will be used to create a new project or expand the existing project expand the existing project right 
So it happens when a company or investor from one country makes a substantial investment uh, in a business in another country. Right. So the key thing about the FDI, FDI is that it is not just buying a stock. It is about gaining and controlling ownership in a uh, or a significant influence o- uh, over in a foreign business. So this is the thing. So the money will go into creating a new project or expanding the new project. It is not just buying a stock. Right. So whenever a stocks are being bought or there is trading that will that is generally known as foreign institutional investment. So try to be uh, we can say aware about this aspect also foreign institutional investment. So generally it is it involves foreign institutional inve- investment uh, involves buying stocks or investing in trades etc right so here it is considered as very short term so because in the short term uh, it is your wish you can invest in the money and you can withdraw money as uh, whenever you want so it is generally short term in nature however foreign direct investment is it has a lot of impact uh, whenever the uh, investment is made and it is generally made on long term period long term period so try to uh, be aware of the convertibility whether rupee can be completely uh, converted uh, when it comes to foreign direct investment or when when it comes to the short term investment the investments also whether there is full convertibility of rupee is there or not so try to be aware of those things also right so we also see this aspect when we study the balance of trade topic so the, uh, we will study about that one also balance of trade then we will uh, know more about the convertibility of the rupee partial convertibility and full convertibility of the rupee right so if you see the broad features of the uh, foreign direct investment buying a controlling stake in a foreign company uh, merging with foreign company starting a subsidiary of a foreign country uh, in a foreign country entering into a joint venture with a foreign company so all these are associated with the foreign direct investment so right there are reasons if you see why companies make foreign direct investments so some of the common reasons are to access new mar- new markets and customers to find cheap labor and resources to expand their product range or expertise to benefit from the government initiatives or incentives offered by the host country so these all these features can be seen in india because in india the labor is cheap and there are several incentives for investments from the foreign players because we are devoid of the capital we need capital so we are giving several incentives so in this way we are trying to attract investment into country so especially the developing countries like india china vietnam bangladesh so all these countries they will try to attract investment from the developed countries so other examples include brazil mexico etc so all these countries are trying to attract foreign direct investment so if we see the some data about the foreign direct investment in, investment in india right so first thing is fdi flows into india so overall increase if we see the latest data so the foreign direct investment was approximately 45 billion dollars during the 2014-15 period however it reached to high of 83.57 billion dollars during the 2021-22 uh, period right next is uh, however there is a recent dip in the first few months of 2023-24 compared to the previous year so this is uh, this could be due to various global and domestic factors however if you see the 2122 da- data it reached the high of 83 billion dollars source of fed is uh, fdi if you see top rooting countries that are to that are investing in india are large portion of uh, portion of fdi into in- india is coming from countries like mauritius singapore and uh, which act these are these countries investment is coming from basically these countries the reasons though mauritius and singapore are small countries they we have some agreements with them uh, agreements like double taxation avoidance agreement 
DTAA. So we have these uh, kind of agreements so that the investment investment may come to India. So because of these countries, I mean, uh, whatever the investment is coming from these countries, that particular investment, it will be taxed only in one country, not in both the countries. So because of that reason, lot of tax will be saved for the investors. So because of that reason, they are rooting all the investment is being rooted through the countries like Mauritius, Singapore, etc. So we will in the when we discuss the main topic, we will understand what is the problem uh, about the the foreign direct investment that is com- coming from the countries like Mauritius, because it is uh, I mean it is uh, said that uh, the people of India only uh, to save the tax they are uh, bringing their whatever the capital or amount money is there they are bringing. Uh, their money through the Mauritius route to escape the tax and to make their black money into white. So this is a concern. We will understand it about when we discuss the main topics. Right. However, countries like USA and uh, UK, they, they are also investing substantially in India. Right. So if, if we see the major investor countries, Currently, top investor countries directly include India include United States, Singapore, Netherlands, Japan, Mauritius, etc. So these are the uh, major investor countries when we see in India. So there have been changes of late in the DT uh, double taxation avoidance agreement with countries like Mauritius, etc. So after that alterations or changes, the investment has been slightly reduced from the countries like Mauritius, right? So if we see the destination into which sectors the foreign direct west, uh, direct investment in, is coming, if we see the sectors, so finance, banking, insurance and IT. So these are the biggest recipients of foreign direct investment, attracting around 41% of the total inflow into the country. So try to remember these areas also, finance, banking, insurance and IT. Right. So these are the areas which are attracting high rate of foreign direct investment. So government initiatives, uh, if we see, we will further discuss the initiatives of the government. So if we see the government initiative, so it is focusing on liberalizing the FDI caps. So the Indian government has taken various initiatives to liberalize liberalize FDI policies, making it easier for foreign companies to invest. It includes simplifying approval processes and increasing the FDA caps in specific sectors. So earlier there were caps on specific sectors that this much amount can only be invested in that particular sector. However, the caps, those caps have been liberalized and I mean whatever the limits have been there, they have been lifted upwards. Challenges. So there are uh, various challenges associated with FDI of uh, FDI also, right? So those challenges are global fluctuations. This uh, these will impact the flow of FDIs into a particular country. Country next is bureaucracy. So when it comes to approvals and etc. So the bureaucracy uh, bureaucracy still uh, is a problem. Next is infrastructure bottlenecks. So w- whatever the FDI is coming to make it easier. To improve the, uh, we can say, the flow of FDIs, infrastructure plays a crucial role. However, in countries like India, still infrastructure is not that much developed. So it is also acting as a challenge. So if we see the roots of uh, uh, FDI flow into India, broadly we can uh, divide them into three roots. That is automatic route. So here, the FDI can directly be brought into India. There is no... uh, Uh, permission of the government is required so after once investment is done it can later uh, inform to rbi or for that matter government so there is no prior permission required in this route so certain sectors have been identified like single brand retail etc so there the investment can be brought in directly however for some type of or uh, to invest in certain type of uh, we can say sectors Prior permission of the government is required only after granting the permission, uh, the FD, the investment has to be come into the sectors. So here, some strategic sectors are like uh, there, like defense, also the broadcasting, broadca- broadcasting or media defense. 
so these type of sectors are there which are strategically important their prior permission is required so there is third route that is government and automatic route so up to a certain level like 24 percent or 49 percent the fdi can come through the automatic route so once the limit is raised next to invest further the approval of the government is required so it is the hybrid route that is approved uh, automatic route and uh, through the approval so these are the routes through fdi will come into india so advantages and disadvantages you can see here so advantages are economic growth job creation technology transfer uh, improved infrastructure increased exports and uh, integration with global markets these are the advantages so the time is running out that's why i am uh, making it faster however you try to read the document once then you will be clear about the things so if you see the disadvantages fe fdi in india especially it applies to all the developing countries also uh, job displacement can occur loss of control over the important we can say stab- establishments or companies environmental concerns unequal benefits right dependence on foreign companies it may increase and uh, it may lead to neo colonialism neo colonialism and exploitation of resources this can also occur so these are the challenges so here are the measures that are taken by the government to uh, increase or attract more attract the fdi into india so here liberalization of fdi policies focus on specific sectors streamlining approval process improving infrastructure foreign investment facilitation portal so this is very very important remember this one foreign investment facilitation portal has been created next is relaxation of fdi norms in strategic sectors so said in certain strategic sectors also the caps have been liberalized right next is production linked incentive schemes have been uh, put up so here also in this way also it is uh, it is um, uh, efforts have been made that fdi can be attracted into this so there are previous questions try to go through the previous questions one is from the ppp and the next question is from fdi so these are the previous questions that are asked from this topic right so this is all about today thank you thank you for joining the lecture uh, see you next time until then have a good day